Hello everyone, I'm Alan Prost and I just thought I'd share with you a way to make algorithms to help you with some of your decision making process for skills testing on group 14. So this is for our first year students in intervention one and I know that uh, from reviewing these online discussions with you we haven't had a chance to go through so as many case studies as I would have liked. So I'm hoping by taking you through this algorithm process um, it'll help you with your decision making and this is an exercise it's really not to just to copy what I'm doing but it's to formulate a way that you can approach um, building your own algorithm so that you're thorough and complete when you're doing your patient assessment and making your decisions for skills evalu evaluation and skills testing so bear with me and I'll take you through a couple of these algorithms so my plan today is to give us a strategy on how to build these algorithms to help with our decision making when um, approaching any kind of patient in a scenario or in real life. So let's consider, uh, first off, what's our primary question? And at this time, I'm going to answer the, try to answer the question, are the ventilator settings appropriate for this patient? All right. So we've got our patient on a ventilator, and we're trying to make um, and interpret all this different data. Now, I know you've gone through this in patient assessment, you've looked at the monitors, you've auscultated, you've done your end title, um, your endotracheal tube check, you looked at the cardiac status, the checks x-ray, the blood gas, and the ventilator. And what I'm going to try to do is give you a mechanism by creating these algorithms on how to interpret all this different information. All right, so it's going to be a little bit simplistic, but one of the first things I do is look at the monitors as I come up to the patient right away. And if their saturation is on the low side, I'm going to do something about that right away. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to increase the FO2. No dilly-dally, no a lot of decision making, not a lot of other interpretations at this point. We don't want our patients to be um, hypoxemic. So we're going to walk up and if their sats are low, less than that 90%, we're going to increase the FO2. Now that's got some implications. I might be keeping in the back of my mind that if I've increased the FO2, I might be considering going up on the PEEP on this patient and be taking that into consideration. If the SATs are high a little bit, all right, so say they're 98 or something like that, I'm going to probably walk up and make a small change on decreasing the FIO2. Now, I might keep in the back of my mind, well, their oxygen requirements are coming down or they were a little high. Maybe I can start thinking about manipulating the PEEP with that in mind. All right, but for sure we want to create, we want to make sure that our patient's not hypoxemic. One of the second things right from the monitor I can do is look at the end tidal CO2. Now we know we've got a range in there of about 30 to about 35 that is acceptable for most of our patients because it reads a little bit lower than the actual PA CO2. But this has got to be taken into consideration with the patient's hypercapnic goals. So we may be intentionally having it high or low. So we don't make any changes right away. I just want to acknowledge that I've got um, my end title. And I might be in the back of mind thinking, well, you know what, if this is a little on the low side, maybe I can decrease my minute ventilation. And we're always trying to minimize the amount of ventilation a patient requires. If it's a little high, maybe I do need higher minute ventilation. So I'm not going to make any decisions on that right away. What that's going to get me thinking about is I should take a close look at that ABG. Okay, so that's some of the things we can do right off the get-go. One of the second things I start thinking about right away when I've got an intubated patient and I'm looking at the ventilator is what's their secretions like? Now I know you've already auscultated and you've got maybe you've got indications for that or you may or not. So if they've got coarse crackles and what I'm demonstrating for you is decision-making trees. Yours might be a little different than mine, that's okay. If they don't have any crackles, maybe I don't need to consider about any secretion removal. But if they do, maybe the answer to that is, yes, I'm thinking about it, but I'm not going to jump right into it. All right? I'm going to make sure that I check with the nurse or who's ever at the bedside, when were they suctioned last? That's an important consideration because a lot of patients have a lot of secretions and they may have been suctioned just 10 minutes ago and we don't want to be overdoing it. So the question from that comes up is, when was the time that they were, or have they been regularly um, suctioned? Is it greater than that amount of time? So they're getting, maybe they're getting sucked in every four hours or every two hours. And if it's greater than that amount of time, maybe that would be stirring me to be thinking about going ahead and suctioning them right away. 
If it's less than the usual amount of time, maybe I should reevaluate that and take into consideration that they really have good evidence that they have a lot of secretions at this time. Am I feeling those coarse crackles through the chest? Do I need, am I going to be effective at going down there with a uh, suction catheter? All right. So take the moment to do that reevaluation. And if you do decide, hey, I've got to go ahead and suction the patient, that's cool. But now in your algorithm, you can be thinking about, hey, if I'm going to suction somebody, what is the proper suction size catheter? Do I have my suction set up to the proper pressures? All right. Um, what has the other people been suctioning get? Have they been getting a small amount in the endotracheal, a small amount each time, or they've been going down two or three times and getting large copious amounts? Because that'll guide me on how many how many times I should go down and how what I should expect to occur. And of course, this is also a reminder that I should probably put on my PPE, particularly if it's open suctioning. All right. And then you can go ahead and go ahead with your suctioning your patient. So what I'm trying to demonstrate for you today is how you can build your decision making tree with these algorithms and go through and build up the level of details that you feel are appropriate for your knowledge level and for what your expectations are at the bedside. All right. After I've looked, considered those secretions, then I'm going to get into some of the other interesting stuff, like such as looking at the chest x-ray. Right? First off, I'm going to remind myself, hey, what's the quality of this x-ray? All right? Did I look for the endotracheal tube position? What lines are available? Are there any major issues with the x-ray that I should consider before I can make any interpretations? Again, the x-ray is just for um, a background kind of review of the patient. We're not going to guide us and jump to any decisions right away. If there's previous x-rays, that can be really useful because I can decide, is this patient's chest x-ray improving? Is it getting clearer? Do I have resolution of the secretions? Is the ARDS improving? And if it is, I might consider that maybe I should be thinking about weaning this patient. So I'm using the chest x-ray to give me guidance on what I should be thinking about doing. If it's not improving or it's getting worse, maybe this patient might be needing increased support on the ventilator. All right? Maybe we've got ARDS occurring or increasing levels of infection that we should be considering. All right? So you notice the chest x-ray is not giving me absolute guidelines on making a decision, but it is helping me. All right. Now let's get into the ventilator, and I'm going to try to make this very simplistic for us. All right. My first thing I look at is those P-plads. All right. We want to make sure our patient's not getting too many pressures. Now you notice I didn't jump right to this. I went to my other steps first. Yours might be a little bit different in your algorithm, but try to be thorough. If my P-plads greater than 30, I know I need to decrease my tidal volumes. I'm not going to jump right in and do it that second. It's not an emergency, but clearly that's a goal. If they're less than 30, I'm going to make sure that I've got the appropriate mils per kilogram for my patient. And that's usually targeting that 6 to 8. If it's greater than that, I might turn it down. If it's less than that, I might turn it up, provided that I'm getting my pre preventing that P-plat from getting above 30 centimeters of water pressure. My goal is to get that six to eight in there because that helps with my VDVT, which is the dead space. Okay. All right. So those are guidelines. God, give me some indications of what I might be thinking about. You know, I haven't made a decision yet. All right. Then the next question for my patient. So maybe this is the first one. And then I'm going to consider, is my patient spontaneously breathing? Look at the respiratory rate set on the ventilator and compared that to what their actual respiratory rate is of the patient. That's supposed to be spontaneous. All right. Okay. So if those are different, then maybe your patient's over breathing the ventilator. And that's going to really alter your blood gases. How much are they contributing to the overall minute ventilation? Whenever I've got a spontaneously breathing patient, I'm going to be considering a spontaneous breathing trial. Now remember, this is my algorithm. Yours might be a little bit different. If I'm considering a spontaneous breathing trial, maybe I can, even if they fail that spontaneous breathing trial, I'm not sure if they're going to pass or fail. We don't have to decide that right at this moment. We're going to do that in another algorithm. But anybody who's got a spon spontaneous breathing, maybe I should be considering switching them to the mode of pressure support. Maybe I can even start thinking about considering them for extubation. All right? So, 
those are some of the considerations we could be doing and helping us guide along that. If they're not spontaneously breathing, let's take a look at their blood gas. Why are they not spontaneously breathing? Maybe we're hyperventilating. They don't have a desire to breathe. But let's take a look at that and let's see if our pH goals are being met. All right. You'll notice I'm not being. I'm trying to be very clear and simplistic here. If our pH goals, and that's often um, the, some physicians, if the patient's closer to uh, having a lot of lung disease, might give us a goal of seven greater than or equal to seven point three zero. Often it's going to be seven point three five if our patient's reasonably um, well maintained or it doesn't have too much lung disease. In really extreme conditions, it might be greater than or equal to 7.25 if we've got severe ARDS and a large amount of metabolic acidosis. All right? So this depends on your orders and it could be varied for that patient. All right? But think about those pH goals. If they're higher than your pH goals, maybe we can decrease minute ventilation. If it's lower than those, maybe we have to increase minute ventilation. You notice? haven't made a decision yet. I'm just going and gathering all the data. All right. The next thing I might look at is my PEEP. And most my PEEP, I'm always considering that in association with the FiO2 that the patient's on at this time. All right. If my FiO2 is quite low, less than 40%, maybe I could, and my PEEPs are greater than five, maybe I'm considering to decrease the PEEP. All right. Maybe I've got too much PEEP on. All right. So that gives me a clue for that. If my FIO2 is greater than, say, 0 0.6, and I know there's a little gray zone in there, and I know students hate that, but in the gray zone, that gives you an option. If you think your patient's getting sicker, so if you've got somebody who's in 50% um, and you think they're getting sicker, let's go to this side. If you think they're getting better, we can error to this side or just watch the patient for a little bit. Let's see what they're going to do or monitor them over time. All right? Maybe we don't have to make a big decision. But if it's high, we definitely want to be considering going up on our PEEP and our mean airway pressure. We know we don't want to be exposed to that oxygen toxicity. All right? So I'm trying to build for you your uh, mechanism for you to consider making different decisions. If you decide to go up on the PEEP, that maybe we're on high FRD, uh, FI, um, FIO2, then maybe we should be considering that ARDSnet network protocols. All right. And that's going to be how we're going to guide us on that PEEP. All right. So I've got a couple of things here. I decided that maybe I need to go up on my minute ventilation. Maybe I need to go up on my PEEP. Those are guiding me now. Maybe I be, should be considering a different mode. If I'm in pressure control already, maybe I should manipulate it more, or maybe I should consider specific lung protective strategies. And that might be something like switching to pressure control, say a pressure control level of 28 to maybe 30, all right? But we know we definitely want to be underneath that 30. Maybe I want to have um, specific PEEP goals, and that we're going to form those with our ARDS network protocols. All right. And maybe to optimize my mean airway pressure, I might increase my TI or I might have an IDE goal of one to one or say one to two, something like that. All right. So we can manipulate our mean airway pressure. So I'm using these algorithms to try to give me some goals here. All right. So here this came back and is part of our, if you're thinking about increasing your PEEP, you're probably thinking about increasing mean airway pressure to help decrease O2 needs, all right? And that means decreasing FiO2, if we can, all right? Now, a lot of students want to do the, I want to increase the PEEP, I want to increase the IDE ratio because they don't want to turn up the FiO2. Remember, we're always going to, this is our first line of defense to prevent hypoxemia, all right? So what I'm doing with this rather complex and busy algorithm, I'm outlining for myself my decision-making points and tree, all right? And yours might be a little bit different, and I think it's the exercise that's important. How are you going to answer this question for yourself? What do you need to assess to answer questions, are the ventilator settings appropriate for this patient? So thank you very much.